welcome back. It's the Ballot 2023 coming to you from Plus TV Africa. We are giving you live updates as they happen across various polling units and wards across the country. Now, hoodlums are threatening, uh, threatened residents in Osho, the area of Lagos, to vote for their candidate who is. Uh, who they did not name. Uh, these areas are Church Street, Adeyemi Street, Adewale Crescent. Now, reports uh, reaching us now indicate that security officials have taken over the polling unit and uh, restored peace. Well, this is not the first that uh, we have heard about violence today. Mm. Um, we've even heard that somewhere around... Um, um, I think um, Okota, there's That's been a, solo. Yes, a few people have been seen trying to grab ballot boxes. And of mm. course, police presence is not so great in well, those areas. Man, what would have, would have even thought that by now? Because in the last elections we had uh, in 2019, yes. uh, that area was like a hot spot. Uh, yes. Ballot boxes were snatched. One would have thought that there would be like lots of deployment of security personnel yeah, around uh, there. As opposed to what we have in, I think I, um, I, when I spoke to some correspondents, we had more police presence on uh, around the Keja Act. Um, um, we also had an Ajegunle, mm. um, Isolo, some parts of Isolo. Okay. But unfortunately, that Okota, which is you know, supposed to be a, mm. a place that should be heavily guarded, wasn't. In fact, at the time we heard that this ballot box attempt, uh, the attempt to snatch ballot box was happening, uh, there was just one police officer who was unarmed. And this mm. is why many oh, no. people keep asking about you know, the, how, the, the how to uh, protect you know, polling units. Because you know, mm. Anik will tell you that constitutionally, you know, arms, armed men are not supposed to be around that area mm. a few meters but then what happened to the few meters away um so it, it caused a lot of things to question and i must say that um we have to have INEC to answer for this but then we're being joined by our correspondent emmanuel olubobokun he is uh giving us going to be giving us some um, um, an update from abuleba i hope i got that abuleba. Yes, abuleba. <laughs> <laughs> Manuel, good, good good afternoon thank you for joining us what's going on in abuleba right now Oh dear, I think we lost it, Emmanuel, um, mm, the connection. Connect, you will yeah. get back to us. So mm. um, I just want to put it out there that um, we've had some statistics coming from Kogi State where mm. the serious um, you know, um, insecurity around some parts of Kogi State. Kogi we State. have it on good authority from s some situation rooms, yes. Um, we've also um, found that there's been, um, I think somewhere in Lagos, um, they found a bag full of PVCs, mm. and what the uh, this was a, at about 10:30 a.m. this morning. And what the residents were able to do was to try to pick those PVCs, sort through them, and see okay. if they could go to the residents of the people who owned those PVCs to see mm. if they could get them out okay. to come vote. A certain place was also reported somewhere in on Lagos Island. Also, um, after 50 people voted, they said the ballot, ballot papers were you know finished. finished. And so uh, the, the interesting part is that when INEC officials are being asked you know questions, or the people mm. who are the election officers who are there they tell you to go to the office to you know for because they're not allowed to ask questions to be, okay, no, because they're not, they're not allowed to mm. speak to the media on these issues and so it, it makes the reporter or whoever is there uh, you know bereft of ideas on mm. how to and move forward on, yeah. with you know the electoral process yeah it, it is really very sad because uh, one would have thought that um, by now, uh, all, all, with all the educa voter education that has been done on the part of um, the National Orientation Agency, I like it really? and some political Please, can parties. Can we not talk about National Orientation Agency? <laughs> <Agent? laughs> Why it hasn't not? hasn't been anything done by the anyway, but we believe mm. that that's a whole kettle of fish that we will have to discuss mm -hmm. on another day. All right, so Bayer is still with us on Zoom, uh, right? Uh, Bayer, uh, let's get your reaction concerning all of these reports that we are getting uh, from Kogi State and, of course, uh, people not being able to vote around some part of the Lagos Island area here in the state. Well, um, like, like I said earlier, this thing shouldn't be happening because we have sufficient experience conducting elections now to know exactly the kind of behavior that are often demonstrated by those who do not want uh, the success of the polls in certain areas, or those who might suspect that their candidates are not strong in certain areas, and therefore they want to disrupt voting there. Um, I was expecting that there will be a lot more robust uh, security presence, especially at the flashpoints. And the, the authorities know those flashpoints. I think as well that it's important for the commissioner of police in each of the states to be seen, to be visible, to be interfacing, to be monitoring what is going on. Uh, I do not know if there's that process is there. We are, we have mobile uh, units. I, I don't want to be misunderstood now. Not mobile police, but units of uh, police officers who are monitoring 
the deployment of their officers uh, and therefore can go around. Because if we have that kind of a scenario, then it will be a lot easier to rapid, rapidly deploy security forces to trouble spots. Um, I've, I've had some people commenting as well, although I, I cannot verify that in the Obayelegushi area of Leki, um, you know, hoodlums are disrupted voting. You know, sometimes these things you can't verify when they put them out. If the authorities themselves are moving rapidly around, if they are mobile, you'll be able to verify some of these things and you'll be able to react immediately. Um, so um, it's, it's worrisome that we are having this, honestly, because I feel we have sufficient experience conducting elections. We know the key points, we know the vulnerable points, and therefore security should have taken all of those those factors into consideration in their deployment. Um, but it's very interesting because you see there was a sudden show of force, you know, earlier in the week before the elections actually happened proper. And, and this somewhat, for those who were, you know, excited to be part of the elections, was some form of, uh, you know, it, it, it doused the fear that people had for voters. But then uh, looking at what has happened today, it looked like um, these people were drafted to one particular place and then every other place was left naked. Um, and just as you've said, we have had, um, you know, a series of electoral cycles that we could have learned from. But every year, I feel like this is almost a deja vu. Why haven't we learned from these experiences to make sure, especially for an election like this, that we were hoping would change the course of things for the country? Yeah, it beats me, to be honest. You know, um, if we go back to 1999 and 2007 elections, we saw the military at key points. They were basically, man they, they, they set up checkpoints at key, at key points, okay? And then the police was freed to actually participate, uh, to, to supervise election in polling units. So if, if anyone is going to cause trouble, a group of people are going to cause trouble, they have to move from place to place. And that will be very difficult if you have the military manning checkpoints in those localities, right? But OK, I really don't know whether that has been done now. Because otherwise, I don't see how you want to check hoodlums from moving from point A to point B, except you have those kind of checkpoints. Um, I haven't seen a helicopter in the sky today. Normally when we have it, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe there are some in, in some other parts of Lagos, some other parts of the country. But normally when you have elections, you also have the helicopters in the sky providing what is called over the horizon surveillance and providing real-time information to, to, to of those on the ground so that they could easily deploy. They're always in radio contact. But I have not had a single helicopter in the sky today. Maybe I missed it. But so I'm becoming a bit more worried now, you know, uh, with all these reports coming in, uh, and of course with the with the feedback we are getting. But uh, the consolation is that so far these have just been a few places, you know, compared to the larger electoral mapping of voters and polling stations that we have. So let us hope that the authorities can swiftly deploy and counter all of this because there's still quite a number of good hours left for voting to take place. And from the look of things again, Bayer, um, we've seen that INEC officials have not showed up early. I mean, as at 11.40 a.m., certain places are yet to see election, uh, electoral of, uh, officials. And um, so this means that what the INEC chairman had told us earlier, that election starts at 8.30 and ends at 2.30, might not necessarily be the case. I'm going somewhere. If these elections are pushed further, that means that we might get late into the evening. And if we're already seeing these pockets of violence where we hear that certain hoodlums are taking over um, certain polling units and telling you who to vote for, who's to say that we can protect the rest of the electorates who are out there who still really want to you know, cast their votes? Good question. Good question. Um, the first thing is, in the in the in the uh, if you look at the elections we've had, you know over the years, we always have situations where elections go late into the evening. Even sometimes we've had elections taking place the following day where they couldn't take place, you know, as designated uh, on on polling day itself. Now one is hoping that we don't get into that, right? Uh, additionally, one is also hoping that we don't get into a situation where people have to come and vote, vote late into the night. You know, especially um, like, but I still maintain uh, from the reports 
thankfully still a few isolated places. And I believe that the security forces can still deal with this problem now. But if it's not dealt with, and if people still having the fear that they might be attacked, people will not want to wait and vote if elections continue to you know, uh, dovetail into dusk. People are not going to want to be there because their safety uh, to them will not be guaranteed. This is why it's important for security forces to do something urgently. Um, having said that, I feel we should, like I said, we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't be having this, you know, cycle, you know, where materials will not arrive on time or electoral officials will arrive late. Somebody I was I was discussing with a couple of days ago told me that INEC only once in his book, well, it wasn't called INEC at the time, it was called FEDECO, but the Federal Electoral Commission, mm -hmm. okay, which at the time was headed by Justice Ovia Whiskey. The only time we knew the electoral body to actually buy its own vehicles for the distribution of electoral materials was when Justice Ovia Whiskey was chairperson of FEDECO. And they bought their vehicles and, and they, they used those vehicles to conduct elections. Of course, it's expensive to do that now because you are going to need those vehicles only for the election. And then after the election, what happens? So maybe elect, the electoral body decided not to do that anymore. But we, are, we keep seeing these logistical handicaps, you know, not moving the materials to key areas because that is done. They get the support of the Air Force and so on to move them. But on, on polling day itself, we still keep getting these reports year in, year out when we have elections, that elections are not starting early somewhere. I think we should, we should have gone you know, beyond this now. All right, Bio, the thing is that uh, these elections um, take place every four years. And indeed, after each election, uh, INEC is aware of all of the issues, uh, issues of uh, where there were really serious attacks and um, hotspots and all of that. One would have thought that uh, with the liaisons that INEC um, has uh, with the security agencies, uh, the Inspector General of Police, the NSCDC officials, one would have thought that these areas that are really prone to violence would have been given more attention uh, as elections go by. And you talked about uh, logistics and INEC um, having to get its own vehicles and uh, transport to convey this material so elections don't start on time. Is it like INEC does not really uh, do its own homework to know the things they actually do need so that we'll not be talking about these little issues every other year when we have elections? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the question of whether they should actually have their own vehicles, I think it's something to be interrogated after these elections. Because, like I said, uh, it was only the Federal Electoral Commission, Federal under Justice Obi Whiskey, that did that. Now, why they stopped, I don't know. Huh? It's just conjecture and speculation. Um, but having said that, um, we we honestly should uh, shouldn't be having these issues. You see, when we talk of having adequate number of police officers, people tend to overlook it until we have elections like this. Thankfully, and I still maintain from the reports coming in, this, these incidents are still isolated. If you look at the fact that we have over 100 and I think 179,000 polling units. So if you look at that, these are still isolated. But not, notwithstanding the fact that they are isolated, they can discourage other people, you know, or discourage people in other places from actually remaining on the queue and wanting to vote because they will not know if they are going to be attacked. And this is why we shouldn't be going through this. You know, for me, we have to revisit. It's too late now because we are already in the elections. We have to revisit the number and the size of the police officers we have in the country. You remember, Justin, I said at the top of the of this segment of the program that we would need over 170,000 uh, times two police officers to be able to keep two police officers in each polling booth across the country. Do we have that? I don't know. You know, and then if we some say okay, we complement that with civil defense. Civil defense is not exactly police, okay? And uh, yes, they can assist, but they are not police officers. So these are issues we have to deal with going forward. I think for now, the saving grace is we only have these things in isolated places. And let us hope they don't spread. And this is why those in charge who are watching us who are listening to us have the responsibility to rapidly deploy to these trouble spots, and not just that, to take proactive measures to ensure that in all those areas that are peaceful, which are still in the majority, by the way, things don't go wrong there as well. Mm. Baya, let's come back to talking about security. I want to look, I'm looking right now at the approved budgets for 
um, a few election cycles. Now, um, security budget for 2015 was 969 billion naira. Uh, in 2016, it was 1.06 trillion naira. Um, in 2017, it was 1.14 trillion naira. In 2018, it was 1.35 trillion naira. In 2019, it was 1.76 trillion naira. Let me fast forward to 2021. We had 1.97 trillion naira. As we speak, the election, uh, the security budget, I beg your pardon, is 2.72 trillion naira in 2023. I think I want to join the rest of the people who are asking questions, journalists, activists, researchers. Where does the money go? Um, looking also at the chat for um, violence in Nigeria, especially before the elections. Surprisingly, I'd like to put it to you that Southeast is topping that list. The Northeast and the North Central are actually at 2 and 3% compared to what's happened in the Southeast. So again, should we be looking at our state governors as opposed to just talking to the federal government because these are the people who are responsibly direct, uh, responsible directly to us? Um, why is this festering, especially now that we are uh, you know, in the midst of a very serious and um, a, big, a very big uh, election? Very good point. Very good point. Um, we, we also, you know, the statistics you gave give us a graphic idea of the progression in, in, in requirement in terms of security for elections, uh, which are also related to the growing number of voters, which will translate into the growing number of uh, electoral materials that have to be produced and so on and so forth. But I want to look at it from maybe two or three points. One, the way we conduct elections itself puts a lot of pressure on, on resources. For example, why should we register voters just a couple of months before elections happen? Why can't people just go and register when they turn 18? Because now, for instance, we have a cut-off period, people who have registered up to for 2023 elections. Why can't it be that after these elections, from when you turn 18, walk into the nearest the population commission office, or the nearest INEC office register and pick up your PVC. Why must you wait for the next election coming up in four years' time? You get it. If we can do this, it reduces the pressure on having to hire ad hoc staff and hire everybody to conduct registration of voters, right? And I think that would take away a sizable chunk of the cost of elections. The second thing is the printing of electoral materials. Do we have sufficient confidence in our own domestic printing facilities? to print sensitive electoral materials. And are we going to keep printing sensitive electoral materials? I don't know where they were printed, by the way. Huh? So uh, this I am just assuming. If we have to be printing abroad, it's going to cost us a lot more money. And that may also have to do with the, the exchange rate of the Naira. If we can print locally, which I think we can, we just need to make sure the security printing and meeting company is properly equipped and, not, and, 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 you know, and, and facilitated. It would also reduce the cost. So bottom line, we need to look critically at taking proactive measures to reduce the cost of elections. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of security, yes, I agree with you. The state governors can do a lot. Sometimes state governors just don't do anything and lay all the blame at the, at the level of the federal government. You know, But they are the chief security officers of the state. And it's not every measure that you deploy to guarantee security that necessarily requires money. Some of it is just attitude orientation and engagement, you know. So all of these things have to be really, you know, tracked and looked at. But now that we, we, we are in an election, if we want to begin to deal with the problem in situ, it's pretty difficult because with due respect, the state governors, they are a vested interest in elections. So once they are invested or, or they have vested interest in elections, it becomes difficult to rely on them mm -hmm. to, to do anything, you know, uh, seriously speaking, within the course of those elections. And that's why I think the IG, we deployed some commissioners of police in some states, and they did a couple of shuffling around. But we need to begin to see this shuffling that was done pay off now. Mm -hmm. The police and the security agencies need to get on the road and arrest whatever kind of problems are emanating from the ongoing process. Baya, I know that you know, you, you're not speaking for the federal government, neither are you speaking for the police or anything, but because we're having this banter, I'm going to put, it, put this question across. Um, we have 
a population that's 200 plus million and you already know the percentage of police to you know um, f every 500 um, Nigerians it's despicable again um, going back to the southeast which is topping the list of violence um, sometime in the middle of last year if I'm not mistaken the southeast governors came together saying that they were going to um, address the issue of you know terrorism and uh, you know violence in their region and um, you made mention of the fact that there might be vested interests, but then we see that it's a mixed pudding. Um, most of them are not all part of the same political party. So what would be the interest that would keep these people uh, from dealing with the killings in their area, especially for the likes of Imo State, Eboyi, and Anambra State, where we've seen even a sitting senator being attacked? Um, is it, I mean, I would say that after, right after that event, which was a tea party, we've not heard anything about it. Is it that we, the people ourselves, are not holding these guys responsible enough and we're always pointing to the federal government? Maybe that's why, you know, that silence has been there for that long. No, definitely. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, for most things in the country, we often just call the president. You know, if the drain in front of my house is not flowing during the rainy season, I, I'm, usually Nigerians will say, what is the president doing? The, the, the drain in front of my house is overflowing. But when I say that uh, states can do something, uh, and I really mean that they can do something. But the moment elections approach, if they do not take proactive measures before elections, and elections now approach, they are already a vested party, you know, in those elections. And so it might be difficult to do anything. If you, for example, take Lagos State, where you have the Lagos State Security Trust Fund, we know the impact of that Lagos State Security Trust Fund, on, on especially when Governor Fashola was governor of Lagos, and when that Security Trust Fund began. And we knew how that, that approach by the Lagos State under Fashola significantly reduced crime in Lagos. So that's the kind of example I'm referring to when I say that state governors can do something it's not all the time that they have to always make reference to the federal government and in any case they know the terrain better you know um so let's hope that we all can take lessons from what is happening and let us hope that we don't record any serious injuries from what the the, the incidents that have been reported already hello hope you enjoyed the news please do subscribe to our youtube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates